Well, welcome everybody to uh, Bookshop Band's special Valentine's lockdown book show. Uh, we're all here again, aren't we? So uh, we couldn't not do something on this this uh, evening. I hope you're all doing really well. Um, and tonight, for the first time in all our lockdown book shows, we are joined by somebody incredibly special. Beth, who's our special guest? Today. We are joined by the wonderful artist that you can probably already see busying away, making, creating wonderful things. This is Chris Riddle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris, for <laughs> coming to join us today. And uh, that looks, you've done a one in the time we've uh, set up this uh, live stream, you've done a wonderful, wonderful opening screen. So we thought we'd keep ourselves nice and minimal and let everybody um, look at, at Chris's hands, beautiful hands. Well, uh, Beth and, and Ben, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. It's been, uh, it was an absolute pleasure doing uh, an event together earlier on this year. Um, and drawing to your music, I think, is something I'm really looking forward to. One of my favourite things to do is to draw live to live music. Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And, pleasure. And... Um, uh, one of the, actually for, for us for musicians as well like seeing somebody respond to to you know what we play is it's really quite an amazing thing yeah it? and it's such a lovely I was thinking about that three-way collaboration so us writing songs inspired by books and then this whole kind of responding to that and also Chris is going to be um, reading some poetry from his beautiful book that Ben's holding up there. It's very small. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, oh, there's a much there we better, go. Thank you, Chris. Much better version. There you go. So, so Chris will be reading some of these poems and we'll be responding with music. So there's very much a, a multi yeah. uh, kind of media collaboration. Absolutely. We don't know what will happen. Um, but we should just say we're cross posting out to loads of different bookshops tonight. Um, so we'll just go through them all and say hello. And wherever you're watching this, um, hello. Um, but we're going out through Atkinson Price, Barthold Books, Books on the Hill, Daunt Book, Fuller Music, Southerns, Jackie Morris, the artist, Marshes, Mr. B's Emporium of Reading Delights, uh, where I actually first, not first came across uh, Chris, but you, you decorated the toilets there, didn't you? Um, and I went to the loo there and sat on one of your illustrations. So that ben, can I just make this absolutely, um, absolutely. clear? I, I drew on the walls. When you say decorated the toilet, that's a horrible <laughs> image. Um, <laughs> I've tried to be as I, I try is, to keep my aim as as sort of. That uh, is not my memory. My memory is tooth marks and things on the uh, monsters on the toilet seat. But uh, ah yes, I, I, yeah, I totally get that. Uh, uh, Pound Arts and Ives Bookseller, the bookshop, Old Bank Books, Open Book, Wigtown Book Festival, Bookends. Books My Bag, the Booksellers Association, Huddersfield Lit Fest, Q Bookshop, Roster Book, Scottish Book Trust, Sheen Bookshop, and the Yellow Lighted Bookshop, and uh, the Book Nook. Um, I think there might even be a couple of Book Nooks on here. Um, so that's uh, welcome to you guys if you're there. Um, and across the waters, Beth? We've got Bookmark in Canada, and we've got Half Fire Books in Colorado, Porky Books, Florida. Um, Old Cuts Attic in Colorado, Second Star to the Right, also Colorado, and Title Wave Books in New Mexico, and Word in Brooklyn. And then we've got in Ireland, we've got Sheila and Gig, and in Sweden, we've got the Uppsala English Bookshop. So thank you all for joining us. It's lovely to have you. So we thought we'd uh, start off this uh, special Valentine's edition of the Lockdown Book Show. Uh, with um, a song inspired by the unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry by Rachel Joyce, um, which tells the story of a man, Harold, who receives a letter from an old friend of his, unfortunately saying that she's in the process of passing away, and he writes a letter to say goodbye um, to her. But eventually, when he goes to post this letter, he realises that this is not enough effort for this old friend of his so he as a gesture walks to the next post box and so begins a story but the song we wrote inspired by it um is inspired by a chapter in the book a, a moment in the book where harold is a young man he's dancing in a bar having a wonderful time and um he looks over and sees this lady maureen looking at him from across the bar 
and Maureen sees this crazy, crazy fella dancing and Harold, they make this connection, but Harold just keeps dancing like a fool and doesn't really worry about it. But at the end of the night, they start talking. One thing leads to another and so begins uh, a, a, a love story within the book. Um, but when I was reading that, I was thinking, if you knew that was the moment in your life when you met your wife-to-be, there's absolutely no way I'd carry on dancing like an idiot. I would stop and prop myself at the bar, think of something terribly witty and funny to say, try to look super cool, and it would have been a complete disaster. So this song is inspired by all of that, and it's called How Not to Woo a Woman. I had all that time to do it, and then I got, then I got tangled up. I'm wearing too many things on my head. <laughs> what lovely earrings and uh, brooch you have! I there. know my yeah. head clip. I've got yeah. some Valentine's presents. Ah. My earrings. Okay, <laughs> clip. There we go. On that fateful day you saw me dancing in the bar Your eyes caught mine and so I came and whispered in your ear I hadn't thought of what to say or what you thought of me But it seemed to go pretty well and we left early Move on now, seven months and we were married by the shore The two of us together we never wanted more I'll get a job to feed us and a home to keep us warm And in a year or so I think our children will be born So onwards seven years and our little boy's five I used to think I'd save him but at least he's still alive We'll have our ups and downs but I know our love will win So I never leave this journey not even at the end of Fast forward 20 years and I'll have been a lucky man Our children will have grown and left the house back in our hands We'll grow up by the seaside and we'll drink tea in the car And I picture us beneath the grave in each other's arms But now I catch myself as I'm dancing in the bar a little overthinking and perhaps a stage too far I'll just enjoy the moment anymore And I would be too scared to dance like a fool And you'd never see me Oh, thank you very so, much So lovely seeing this response It's great, isn't it? A little bit of blue pencil crayon to sort of suggest maybe this is a memory. This is a, a sort of Harold sort of thinking back to, to a, a, an earlier time. Mm. Um, and haven't we all been there? Um, I, I say to both you and, and, and Beth, that, that sort well, of... I, mean, um... I don't dance like an idiot. I don't da my dancing is honestly <laughs> like super cool. My daughter will tell you that, right? Not dad, but no, okay. No, yeah, definitely... <laughs> My mine too. Um, I used to cut some crazy shapes um, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. uh, Sherry's um, sort of nightclub in uh, in Brighton, which is where um, back in the thirties uh, the great Fats Waller actually played Brighton, and he played uh, stride piano at uh, Sherry's nightclub. Wow. Obviously, I that wasn't when I was at Sherry's. I was there in the eighties during the. <laughs> the great pomp of new romanticism and i was at art school so my goodness i'll i'll, I'll leave that uh, image um uh, in in your minds um and what i'd love to do is read the first sort of poem um from 
poems to fall in love with. Um, and this is by talking about sort of, I suppose, uh, dancing and partying, um, the great uh, aficionado of, of, of wild parties, uh, Lord Byron. And this is a beautiful poem called She Walks in Beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace, which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express, how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek, and o'er the brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. sharing your your choices of poems with us um i ben bought me this book for my birthday and i was just telling chris that i've got it at my bedside and i plan to read one poem a night the first time i opened the book i ended up reading a lot of them in one <laughs> go because i couldn't put it down so it's a good advert for your book there chris um, beth thank you for that I, I would add that one of the great pleasures of poetry is the rereading so, um, you know, once <laughs> read, you can go back endlessly. I agree. I agree, especially especially with poems. I think I, I, I rarely get round to rereading novels, but I think with poems, that's that's part of their their work, isn't it? How they work. Mm. I, I, someone recently recently told well showed me that actually, when you listen, when you hear someone read a poem. It's it, like the transformation when you hear it the second time, someone reading it, for, for me anyway, in terms of like getting so much more of the meaning. Um, it's probably just because I'm incredibly slow. No, uh, I think you're, you're totally really right. It was, it was quite yeah. revelatory. I was like, it made, yeah, it really it sunk you down into, yeah. into it. Like. I've been part of a writing group, um, some of you might know, over lockdown, and it would have been tonight, but we were a bit otherwise engaged. But we respond to, we, we choose a poem, and then we respond to it, um, and then we read them to each other. And it's all very nice, you know, there's only a few of us, and we just share what we've written. But we always read it twice, because you do, you, you suddenly hear so much more, and it can take mm. on a whole different meaning. And it depends where you are in, in life and in your day and everything as well, I think. It does. Uh, poems change, don't they, Beth? And I, 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 what I enjoy, I think, with, with poetry is, is sometimes you, know, you, you get a poem with absolute clarity and, and it speaks to you and you think, yes, I know what that's all about. But the poems I enjoy most are the poems that actually have an ambiguity. And in that way, I think um, they're similar... To music in my response to them. Um, I love music that, that sort of you explore and changes each time you, you listen to it. And poems can do that. So some of the more obscure poems are the poems I enjoy most, where you are not quite sure what they mean, but you want to keep coming back to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm getting to see a couple of comments saying it's a bit echoey. So um, maybe, Chris, if you do turn on your echo cancellation after all, uh, maybe that uh, in sorry in your uh, thing that might might solve sort it. This out. Uh, anyway, we'll see. Thanks for the comments, guys. It's so nice to see people coming in. Um, 
Wendy Carter, Lindy Platt, Ken Humphreys, um, Brian Elliott. It's yeah, really lovely to see everybody. I hope you're all doing really well. Uh, do let us know where you are. Yes, even send us a photo of your Valentine's <laughs> evening. And we'll, in the meantime, send, we'll um, sing another song inspired by another book. And this one uh, was another a love themed one, kind of, <laughs> Un, quite unrequited, but um, a, a kind of fun fun story in a way. It's the teleportation accident by Ned Bowman. It's one of my favourite authors, and this is about Lursa, this guy who um, is in Germany in the just before the Second World War, and he is part of a, a, a scene of people who are kind of artsy, kind of um, you know, just just starting out in their careers, I suppose. And he's trying to get in on this scene and finds it quite hard because he's a little bit. Um, annoying <laughs> and he's a bit on the outside but his his love really is um his one of his interests is he wants to find out what this teleportation accident was it's a kind of historical event um and in the meantime he also falls in love with this girl called adele hitler who used to be one of his pupils and has suddenly become very beautiful to him and he starts off um a, a kind of trail of her where she's where she gets up to and off to so he follows her and anyway the song says most of this so I feel like I'm explaining <laughs> it but he's quite a funny interesting character and this journey takes him all kinds of different places um, including the uh, Shakespeare and Co in Paris the bookshop and then onwards from there and he gets obsessed with I think he's got quite an obsessive nature so maybe this is more about obsession rather than love but we'll sing you the song anyway it's called Accidents and Pretty Girls features quite possibly the most extraordinary ukulele drum solo that you'll see today. Yes. Actually. Yes, Ben. Okay. Oh, oh. 
some pretty girls and what's the one thing that could uproot almost anything a teleportation machine a love that had a hold over him a teleportation machine Wow, Chris, that's amazing. I think Chris had done most of that by the time we'd finished the yeah, intro. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm just wondering what the teleport the teleportation machine actually looks like. I'm I'm imagining it's like a sort of you know one of these theatrical devices that where you mm -hmm. fall through the stage or you appear somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I think that's what he was imagining, and I can't remember. I can't remember actually if it describes what it is or that doesn't. It, I don't want to spoil the story. Actually, it might be that it kind of partly doesn't exist in the same way that he thought it did exist right yeah. and, it, and it and it does kind of go i have to that's one of the things i would like to reread if i if i gave myself the time because there's some stories you think you you remember and then you're like actually did that happen like that or did that happen like that but you know however you want to imagine the teleportation machine i think it i think there was some kind of you know big historical accident and that's part of part of it but yeah, <laughs> and it's also uh, something I've I've never really thought of until uh, you, you know you mentioned this book, which is there must be um, there must be sort of members of uh, the Hitler family who have nothing to do with uh, with the sort of notorious Hitler, who mm -hmm. would have to just disavow their their surnames from from then on. Yeah, it's never never known if he, she's a relation. Or is it? No, I think no. I think it's with no risk. But yeah, I no. I mean that's the thing, isn't it? I guess with any any name of that kind of notorious no. nature, it, it's you're it's constantly going to yeah. be the bane of your life unless yeah. you change it. Change it. Yeah. Well, my my uh, name was actually uh, Ripper, uh, and I had to change oh, really? that um, to Riddell, obviously, because and, and my first name was Jack. So you know, it just it wasn't <laughs> working for me. Um, it was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, <laughs> Now, we were talking, weren't we, about sort of poems and sometimes poems that sort of one um, actually sort of gets the meaning of um, completely, you know, first, first on first reading. And one of my absolute favourite poems is the one I want to read to you next, which is um, by Brian Patton. And I, I met Brian, um, this is my um, sort of arty story, um, I met Brian at a party, um, one of the uh, parties that uh, Penguin Books used to um, have, um, up on the top of a building in uh, in Kensington, which had uh, flamingos in little sort of you know enclosures, and uh, you would go to the top of the this this um, uh, big building and and wander through a rooftop garden with flamingos, and that's where I appropriately enough met Brian pattern for the first time and we ended up working together which was rather wonderful and uh, when I'm asked you know, what my favorite poem is I, I have many many favorite poems but I think one of them almost my desert island uh, poem would be this one and it's called a small dragon and what I love about it is it is just slightly mysterious um, one's not quite sure how this poem has come about, who the narrator is, uh, where he lives. But it's that's exactly what I like. It's, it's if you could imagine a sort of rather uh, engaging, slightly surreal novel um, contained within a few verses of a poem, it would, I think, describe a small dragon rather well. Let's try some dragon music. A Small Dragon by Brian Patton I found a small dragon in the woodshed I think it must have come from deep inside a forest Because it's damp and green And leaves are still reflecting in its eyes I fed it on many things, 
dried grass, the roots of stars, hazelnut and dandelion. But it stared up at me, as if to say, I need food you can't provide. It made a nest amongst the coal, not unlike a bird's, but larger. It is out of place here, and is quite silent. If you believed in it, I would come hurrying to your house to let you share my wonder. But I want instead to see if you yourself will pass this way. And my dragon has made a little nest and it's a nest of possibly old Valentine's cards and love letters. <laughs> there it is, just just furnishing its nest of coal. Beautiful. So who knows? <laughs> That's absolutely stunning. I need to, we need to uh, I need to sit down and read all these read all these again afterwards. I think that'll be my night phones work. Um, thank you. So there is a. Um, as a donation link, uh, we're going to be donating a, uh, a chunk of anything that any people would like to donate to the charity Mind tonight, um, looking after people's mental health, which is obviously very important during, especially during this time, but always. Um, and okay, what are we moving on to now? We are moving on That's to. A good question. Oh yeah, okay. So if anyone um, tuned in earlier. Um, to the Folk on Foot Festival, which has been running all day. Um, we, we did a little set during that, and uh, um, we, we played a song which we're going to attempt to play again tonight. Um, and it was the first song that Beth and I ever wrote together. So in that sense, it's uh, incredibly romantic. Um, very but it's appropriate. Very appropriate. Today, yeah. But it's inspired by um, a traditional Japanese folk tale called the bamboo cutter's daughter um and about this sort of wonderful the most beautiful ethereal being comes down from the moon to earth and is adopted by a bamboo cutter and word of her beauty gets out um to the world the land and she is courted by uh, these five knights whom who have never seen her they just take people's word that she's the most beautiful beautiful uh, being on earth and um but she's just frankly rather annoyed by them and so sets them impossible tasks um and these five knights go off and four of them cheat they they pretend that they've fulfilled this task and um and the fifth and the fifth knight goes out and actually tries to fulfill the task and immediately dies and in the version i read um like he gets like the fifth night gets about half a sentence and he died he didn't work so i was i was a bit um i was on the side of the fifth night slightly because he was the only sort of vaguely honest one out of them but uh so this song um is i guess to give the fifth night a little bit more screen time in the story um and the song is called The Fifth Night and the Moon Princess. <clears throat> Five ships 
lips leave in the morning and I'll try to join the one you're in so I flew And I way to be doing a gig so great <laughs> it's, it's nice to be doing a gig at all and then to be able to watch chris drawing uh, these amazing images as we play i i understand i suppose your inspiration because the uh, the fifth night uh, is tasked with um uh, sort of climbing to a high place, to a swallow's nest in the hope of mm -hmm. finding uh, uh, something sort of precious that really won't be there uh, mm -hmm. and falls to his death yeah. Um, so he doesn't last very long at all. No, he um, meanwhile, the uh, the the moon um, princess, um, there is a sort of happy ending of sorts because she returns to the moon uh, with uh, with her sort of uh, moon uh, compatriots. They come down to take her away, and off mm. she goes. Um, mm. it, yeah, it was a one. It's an amazing story. Like I remember first first reading it because we we when we first started the bookshop band in 2010 uh mr b's and Porium of reading delights were were um uh, doing doing we had all the authors come in and we'd pick these folk stories to read and it was it was really wonderful uh, we picking folk stories from different countries but but i hadn't read a folk story like it really and it's it's incredibly old i think i'm right in saying the, the bambi cutter's daughter like it's very old old tale but um yeah just to have all these sort of celestial things happening for, in it say, it feels quite a proper aliens yeah, I know, basically <laughs> it, did. it was great it was like well british folk so folk stories are often just about ale and no it's not <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I uh, 
talking about sort of folk tales, that there's a lovely, lovely poem in um, in in my sort of collection by uh, Neil Gaiman, all about um, reading the three bears to his uh, his two year old daughter. Um, and it, it's very sweet. But what's rather sort of lovely about the poem, and something I didn't realise, was the original um, Goldilocks tale was um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It was actually the old woman and the three bears. Ah. Um, so it was an old lady um, who lived with three bears. We don't know why, but but she did. Um, and then it got changed, as folk tales and fairy tales often do. And, um, and she sort of became this young... Um, rather sort of impudent girl who who wrecks furniture and <laughs> you know sort of eats raids the larder you know that sort of thing. But uh, interesting to imagine an old lady, much more dignified, um, mm. being. Uh... But that's got nothing to do with what I'm actually drawing, which is a sort of <laughs> flame-haired. Um, what I would describe, I suppose, as a sort of flame-haired siren, and. Um, I'm, I'm drawing this um, because this is one of these wonderful, I suppose, appropriate um, sort of poems for Valentine's uh, Night. Uh, and this is a, a memory. This is a poem by uh, John Betjeman about an early memory of his. Um, and that sort of poignancy you, you, you get uh, when you imagine your, your first love. And this is a wonderful poem by, by John Betjeman about his first love, who he um, he meets in the licorice fields of Pontefract. And what I enjoy about it is it sort of, it sheds a little sort of light on what John Betjeman's tastes in, in sort of uh, the fairer sex might be. Um, that sounds a terribly awkward introduction. Um, but I think of it... Uh, I think of it often, back in the days when I used to take trains and go places, um, I loved um, walking past uh, John Betjeman's statue in St Pancras. Um, it's a wonderful statue on an upper level. Um, if we ever go to Europe again on Eurostar, do check it out. Uh, you can walk past this lovely statue. And what I really love about it is Sir John Betjeman has got this wonderful sort of portly figure something I'm cultivating at the moment. Um, and he's standing looking up at the roof, at, at the splendid St Pancras. The statue is a, uh, a, a sort of showing him as the, the, the saviour of St Pancras as a, uh, as a station. Um, and if you approach close enough, you realise that the waistcoat the statue is wearing is actually burnished because people have come and touched his waistcoat, his tummy bulging mm -hmm. in his waistcoat for, for good before they set off on their travels. So oh, wow. if ever you set off from St Pancras, go and rub uh, John Betjeman's tummy. Uh, it's good luck. Well, thank God I've still got a bit of a tummy here as well, I, I feel like. It, we all have, uh, yeah, Ben. Yeah. It, it, it's lockdown tummy. Um, yeah. or, or the Betjeman bulge, I think it's also known <laughs> as. So this is the licorice fields at Pontefract. In the licorice fields of Pontefract, my love and I did meet, and many a burdened licorice bush was blooming round our feet. Red hair she had, and golden skin, her sulky lips were shaped for sin, her sturdy legs were flannel flacked, the strongest legs in Pontefract. The light and dangling licorice flowers gave off the sweetest smells from various black Victorian towers. The Sunday evening bells came pealing over dales and hills and tanneries and silent mills and lonely streets where country stops and little shuttered corner shops. She 
she cast her blazing eyes on me and plucked a licorice leaf. I was her captive slave and she my red-haired robber chief. Oh, love, a love I could not speak. It left me winded, wilting, weak, and held in brown arms, strong and bare, and wound with flaming ropes of hair. These are her flaming ropes of hair. Amazing. <laughs> I like that music. Uh, that, that had a lovely elegiac quality to it, uh, sort of remembrance of past loves. Um, and at this stage, um, I, I want to put both you, uh, Ben, and you, Beth, um, you know, slightly on guard here. So we'll maybe mm -hmm. catch you off guard. Uh, I want to ask you um, each uh, who your first love was. It could have been each other. I mean, I, I, we haven't uh, rehearsed <laughs> oh, this. So, uh... No. Okay, my first... Oh, okay, now I remember. My first crush, my first proper crush was in primary school and it was a girl who used to sit opposite me called Josephine Wormsley. So if you're listening, Josephine. Josephine, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Josephine Wormsley and... Uh, what, I mean, what a great name. What a, what a romantic name. <laughs> Josephine Wormsley. Um, Not as romantic as my, my first love's, well, his name, his stage name. <laughs> was somebody his? that I, I it's my parents are listening so, and they know him. So, um, <laughs> so all through all through my childhood and secondary school, um, he's now called Oliver Darling. Oh, Oliver Darling. Is that no, Oliver, Oliver Darling. Comma Darling or, or is he Mr. Darling? Uh, that's a good question. He, he, <laughs> he was called Oliver Cheney. Um, oh. So Oliver, if you're listening, does he know that he was your? I first? think yeah. I think I sent him a lot of Valentine's cards and just <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure Oliver, was. Oliver, darling, wow. <laughs> darling Oliver. Uh, well, my, my uh, since we're sharing, um, yes, mine, yeah. tell us, Chris. I'm I'm often. I say often. I have been criticised in the past for um, drawing a certain type of librarian when I draw librarians for illustrative mm -hmm. purposes um, and I've been criticized uh, and been asked you know why do my librarians all have cardigans and and sort of you know uh, hairstyles of a certain type you know it's terribly old-fashioned and I've got a confession my, my first crush was on a young librarian um, Miss Barnes she was a librarian at my school and I went to school many years ago um, in that sort of, I suppose, for, for sort of cultural references, we could say the Mad Men era, you know, the sort of 1960s, mm -hmm. um, when uh, there was a sort of a certain fashion for, for very, very cantilevered bras, you know, very prominent sort of, this, this seemed to be fine. Um, and I will never forget Miss Barnes um, allowing me to sit on her knee um, and sort of, you know, sharing a book with me, sort of leaning over very close, and I was just aware of this uh, this construction, um, almost a, a bosom for a pillow, um, <laughs> and it, it had a very powerful effect on me. And so now mm -hmm. I, I've, I've always rather sort of loved librarians ever since. And spent your life drawing her every time. Uh, she does come back from time to time. That, that's that's <laughs> true. Um, I did a little visual essay called uh, "Librarians I Have Loved," and <laughs> Miss Barnes featured uh, prominently in that. Oh, Latin librarians deserve a lot of love. Absolutely. They, they do. do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Beth, I think uh, the next love song. Oh, the next love song. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel totally unprepared for. <laughs> in my head I've just gone a bit I think we've been watching this other festival all day and my head's just gone oh yeah we can just watch music and then suddenly listen to other people play music and then suddenly it's like oh yeah we have to play a song yeah yeah and it's lovely hearing your poems um or your 
poems from your book as well, Chris. So like, it's lulling me into a false sense of security, and then suddenly <laughs> it's like, oh yes, we do have to do something. <laughs> Remember things. So I, 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 I had a song. I had a lovely review, Beth, um, just the other day from a poetry reading I gave, and someone said it was so calming and soothing, I nearly fell asleep. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or not. All the time. <laughs> yeah, I. I have to admit, we've I've had similar where people have said, oh, just yeah, just nearly falling asleep to your music. I don't, I don't know how to take that either. I don't know if that's a good thing. I think it is a good thing. Yeah. People always have said that I've got um, a good voice for singing children to sleep, but unfortunately it's never really worked on our own child, so I don't know about that. <laughs> so this song is, um, is off an album that I made uh, last year, year before, probably year before now, um, so in a band that I have called Marshes, and the album is called When the Lights Are Bright, and this is a song from it, which is it's basically what I call a cheesy love song, but it's also, well, it's a, you know, I meant it when I wrote it, and it's um, kind of about our journey together, <laughs> or, it, you know, the start of our journey together, mm. which has gone on from a few years ago. I thought you were going to say too long. It's gone on too long. <laughs> oh, get me out of here. No, not at all, Ben. It's oh, lovely oh. spending lockdown with you. Yeah, and it's been great, yeah. Um, I'm going to take these off again, yeah, so yeah. apologies. It's called Who We Are, and as a chorus, Chris, if you fancy joining in, you're very welcome. And everyone out there, if you fancy yeah. joining in, the chorus goes... Should we just do a little yeah, chorus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chorus goes one, two, three, four. Who we are, who we are, who we are. Oh, 
to clear the eyes and to find out why we are who we are who we are who we are who I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Beth, and then I almost fell asleep. That was, <laughs> oh, that was so soothing. Huge yeah. compliment. Huge so compliment. soothing. <laughs> Me too. I nearly fell asleep. <laughs> I, I enjoyed, actually, um, just before we, we started um, talking to you, I think um, Beth had to um, nip out um, to, um, uh, forgive me, Beth, uh, answer the call Hi. of nature. Mm-hmm. Um and so uh, Ben and I were just, uh, Ben said, could you give me a few sort of uh, hints as to sort of background music you, you might enjoy with, with the poems as you read them? And, uh, and that was quite fun, just sort of thinking, you know, Pontefract, uh, licorice fields of Pontefract, could we have something sort of elegiac, um, maybe sort of um, uh, the, 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 the dragon, something a little plinky, dragon-like, you know, that, that's the sort of useful musical notes I was giving you, Ben. Um, and for this one um, that I want to read now, um, it's by one of these poets who I think often, I mean, one of her great sort of pleasures, she is the perfect lockdown poet, because back in the 19th century, before lockdown was as fashionable as it is today, um, she spent most of her time in her bedroom. Um, and uh, if only there had been the internet when uh, Emily Dickinson was uh, in Amherst in her bedroom, she would have been a gigantic star. As it was, we we discovered her afterwards. Um, and what I love about uh, Emily Dickinson's poems is that they are as sort of a little bit like Brian Patton. Uh, they they can just dart away from you. You think you've got them. You think you know what they are, and then they sort of evaporate and they go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, she she is a sort of wonderful wonderful uh, sort of poet in in that sense. Um, and the other thing I love about sort of Emily is is that she seems to be writing for herself and nobody else. And that's something that, that is a great sort of, you know, pleasure to sort of, uh, uh, to read a poet where you sort of feel you're not being uh, pandered to. Um, this is a sort of insight into someone's thoughts um, and their own world, you know, and, and you can in, enter that world or not. It mean doesn't mean anything to Emily. She's not writing for you. She's writing for herself, and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, and so I said to Ben, could could we have some sort of tumultuous, tempestuous uh, music for this? And uh, it's a short poem, so this is going to call upon uh, Ben and Beth's uh, musical um, repertoire, like like no other. Um, and there'll be plenty of space, I think, for for the music to to sort of set up a what I imagine is a seascape. Um, while I read this next poem, I'm enjoying the jingles and the jangles. Good, isn't it? Um, okay. Beth, you're on melody. I'm on uh, thunder. And this is just to get us in the mood for later. This is Emily Dickinson's poem, Wild Nights, Wild Nights. <laughs> with a wonderful improvised um, opening that will begin when you're ready.
Wild nights, wild nights, were I with thee, wild nights should be a luxury. heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but more tonight in thee. I love that touch of Elgar and that lovely sort of yeah. quality to it. Was that was that the bells, Chris? That... Yeah, the, the bells were good. The bells were. It was as if Emily was sort of having a wild night, possibly with a couple of Santa's reindeer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah. could be a short story in and of itself. <laughs> and I hadn't intended it to be Elgar, but it suddenly appeared in there. So that was it. Was a nice kind of ah, oh, yeah. Yes, I was enjoying it. Yes, there, there is sort of Emily, sort of superimposed upon the sort of sea, having having a wild night, the sort of wild night you would have in eighteen seventy two in Amherst, um, maybe on a snowy evening. Who knows? It sounds yes. great. It sounds great. It sounds like <laughs> like Wigtown. <laughs> yep, yep, a lot like that. Wigtown. Yeah, I mean, it, it's got a ring to it, hasn't it? We we have had some wild nights in Wigtown, actually, yeah. weather-wise, and you know, back in the day. Back in the day, absolutely. Some great, great parties. We've got songs about our wild nights in Wigtown. Yeah. They're that, that extraordinary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> shall we? Speaking of wild, uh, shall we? Um, shall we attempt a song inspired by this book here? Yes. Okay. So this book is Caroline by Cornelius Medby, and it's a beautifully uh, romantic love story about a man who um, completely falls in love with a donkey um, who he also believes is a grand chess master um, and he tries to convince all his friends that this donkey is extraordinary um, and obviously not everyone thinks he's completely mad um, but then um, oh, I don't want to spoil it I don't know I won't give anything away but it's uh, um, basically, his friends eventually eventually believe him, and uh, but uh, but anyway, it's wonderful, wonderful. So this is a, a tiny, tiny little song about having a crush. So relevant. So Josephine, Josephine Warmsley, <laughs> this one's for you. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. 
I've got a crush, but I worry that I may have made you up. Friends say I'm mad, but. I now realise that what that wonderful Netflix show, The Queen's Gambit, was missing was a donkey. A donkey. Uh, yeah, that would yeah, have been exactly. a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell from your drawing it would have been a spectacular scene. <laughs> <laughs> I want a donkey now. Oh, there is a, there's a donkey just up the road from us, which is yeah. really lovely. To I, I went on a 10k run this week. My, mm -hmm. It was kind of... Maybe my third maybe but only just um but i but the, my highlights were passing a donkey <laughs> and, uh, and some chickens and some sheep but it was very early in the morning and all the sheep that were lying down against the hedges as the sun rose just it's quite you know you don't often get to i don't often get to see that uh sleeping sheep that was nice well i'm so pleased we got to um uh, include the donkey um, and I'm really pleased that we got to include this poem, which is um, uh, a poem by the wonderful, wonderful poet Derek Walcott. And maybe, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It's Valentine's night, but it's one of those, you know, sort of odd things. All, all the things we, we sort of um, look forward to in a way are slightly changed, aren't they, in the, in the current situation. But um, at the same time, there are also always reasons to feel hopeful about things and to seek solace maybe in the sight of a donkey or um or maybe uh binge watching a netflix series um and um and this poem for me uh is all about i suppose solace and maybe loving oneself you know learning that sort of sense of you know mindfulness and and well-being um and coming to terms with yourself. It's called Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life.
oh, I really felt that. That was so nice. <laughs> Really lovely reflective poet poem. Mm. I really enjoyed that. Just, yeah, we do, we do need to remind ourselves to to look inwards sometimes. I think mm. as well because we're you know we're all trying to do so much as well for each other that sometimes you do need to you do need to look. I yeah. uh, my my ad advice would be um, get a sketchbook um, and draw in it. Um, maybe write down the uh, song lyric or uh, a recipe for what you're going to have for tea. But but you know keep keep a sort of keep something where you can write and draw um, all the time. It's kept me sane. Uh, mm. a sort of pencil and a, a sketchbook at all times. Mm. It's such yeah, it's really good advice. I've, I've, there's only a few points in my life where I've had like a an actual book that I've always like a, a sketchbook that I've always kept with me for notes and ideas and drawings and things. But I don't know why I don't do it more because the times I have done that have been those those get filled up with just the most amazing memories and yeah, they're very precious things uh, afterwards. Mm. I've, I've, yeah, I found writing particularly very therapeutic in this time and this this writing group that I've been doing is it's just a way of expressing things that you're not quite sure how to mm. express sometimes and and doing it in response to a poem is quite nice because it's you're sparking something that's obviously somewhere in you but you don't know where where it's coming from and so you're just free writing we only have you know 10 20 minutes to write something I think giving mm. yourselves those limitations which is where a lot of our songs come from as well as the limitations mm. of time and and you know inspiration mm. i think that can be quite therapeutic speaking of which um chris would you like to finish off today with um with uh, your the, the last poem that you were going to read I would love to, um, Ben. I'm so pleased we, we had time for this. Um, mm. And uh, our audience, if they're out there, has been wonderfully indulgent. Um, so if, if you could indulge me just a moment longer, um, I would love to read this, um, this uh, poem. It's by one of my favourite Victorian poets. Uh, not, uh, not Wordsworth. Love Wordsworth, but not Wordsworth. Uh, not Keats. I just love, love Keats, but this isn't Keats. Um, not, uh, not, not Tennyson with his wonderful In Memoriam. Um, uh, Christina Rossetti. Wonderful, wonderful Christina Rossetti, but, but not that either. Um, <laughs> this is the one and only, the incomparable Edward Lear. And this is one of his wonderful, wonderful, they call, they, they, I suppose they're called nonsense poems in a sense, but like all very, very good nonsense, uh, they make sense. And so uh, this is um, a rather poignant, one might even sense autobiographical. I know sometimes it's been considered an autobiographical poem um, by Edward Lear. It's called The Courtship of the Yongi Bongi Bo. Gonna play, what we're gonna play. Anything. Okay, here we go. You start. <laughs> On the coast of Coromandel, where the early pumpkins blow, in the middle of the woods lived the Yongi Bongi Bo. Two old chairs and half a candle, one old jug without a handle. These were all his worldly goods in the middle of the woods. These were all his worldly goods of the Yongi Bongi Bo, of the Yongi Bongi Bo. Once amongst the bong trees walking where the early pumpkins blow, to a little heap of stones came the Yongi Bongi Bo. There, he heard a lady talking to some milk-white hens of Dorking. Tis the Lady Jingly Jones on that little heap of stones. Sits the Lady Jingly Jones, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Lady Jingly, Lady Jingly, sitting where the pumpkins blow, will you come and be my wife, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. I'm tired of living singly on this coast so wild and shingly. 
I'm a weary of my life. If you'll come and be my wife, quite serene would be my life, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. On this coast of Coromandel, where shrimps and watercresses grow, prawns are plentiful and cheap, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. You shall have my chairs and candle, and my jug without a handle. Gaze upon the rolling deep, fish is plentiful and cheap. As the sea, my love is deep, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Lady Jingli answered sadly, and her tears began to flow. Your proposal comes too late, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. I would be your wife most gladly, here she twirled her fingers madly. But in England, I've a mate. Yes, you've asked me far too late. For in England, I've a mate, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Mr. Jones. His name is Handel, Handel Jones Esquire and Co. Walking fowls delights to send, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Keep, oh, keep your chairs and candle and your jug without a handle. I can merely be your friend. Should my Jones more Dorking send, I will give you three, my friend, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Oh, you've such a tiny body. And your head so large doth grow, though your hat may blow away, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, though you're such a hobby doggy, yet I wish I could modify the word I needs must say. Will you please to go away? That is all I have to say, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Down the slippery slopes of myrtle, where the early pumpkins blow. To the calm and silent sea fled the Yongi Bongi Bo. There, beyond the Bay of Girtle, lay a large and lively turtle. You're the cove, he said, for me. On your back beyond the sea, turtle, you shall carry me, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Through the silent, roaring ocean did the turtle swiftly go. Holding fast on his shell rode the Yongi Bongi Bo, with a sad, primal motion towards the sunset isles of ocean. Still, the turtle bore him well. Holding fast upon his shell, Lady Jingly Jones, farewell, sang the Yongi Bongi Bo, sang the Yongi Bongi Bo. From the coast of Coromandel, did that lady never go? On that heap of stone, she mourned for the Yongi Bongi Bo. On that coast of Coromandel, in his jug without a hand, still she weeps and daily moans on that little heap of stones. To her dorking ends, she moans for the Yongi Bongi Bo, for the Yongi Bongi Bo. <laughs> tragic, tragic. Oh, so tragic. Oh my goodness. And I, I think I, I would have heard that a lot when I was younger, but I, it didn't have the same meaning for me then. <laughs> so yes. I think that's the thing about Edward Lear. It does. You can, you can read it at any age, or you can hear it at any age, and it, and it can mean different things. Like, like we were talking with poetry. Mm, absolutely. The same with songs. It's like mm -hmm. you have a meaning when you write these things, but they. They go out yeah, and true. get into the world, and whoever get translated in everyone's mind who hears them or reads them or yeah. sees them. Next. But it's so inspiring, Chris. Thank you so much for for reading all this poetry, and I think it's. Well, I I was going to say say to you, Beth. Thank you and Ben so much for for sort of playing and 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 having me um, uh, along to sort of share this evening. It's been. Uh, absolute sort of delight a lovely way to sort of spend uh valentine's um oh this is the best valentine's day apart from beth chris honestly 
<laughs> well said, Ben. Well said. Um, my wife Jo is is impatiently waiting. You know, she's, yeah. well, what is, what is, what have you been doing in the study? I know nothing. Nothing. I've just been <laughs> sharing some lovely music and and, and drawings. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, and I'm loving this that, that journey back through your drawings yeah. just then. That was a, it's a lovely way to to remember what's just happened as well. Yeah. Um, and Chris, if, t if I'm right, then uh, uh, you might put up some of these pictures on your big cartel shop in a in a couple of weeks or so, or at some point. So um, if if and when you do, let us know, and we'll we'll send out a tweet if anyone's interested in. Yeah. How lovely. I will do that, Ben. Those. That would be wonderful. But in the meantime, everybody, all those poems came from Poetry to Fall in Love With, um, illustrated and collected by Chris Riddle. Um, and it's out Chris Riddell, as I've since learned. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Ripper. Yeah. Um, and, yes. Uh, um, and it's out in paperback. Um, this is the hardback edition. And paperbacks on your screen right there. Um, so do go and find it. And if you'd like to donate, um, we'll be donating a proportion to Mind tonight. Um, the link's in the description and to all our merchandise and various books and things. But thank you so thank much, you. everybody, for tuning yeah, in. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's, it's, it's not too late to share. I should have said this earlier on. But if you want to share it, people can still see it and, and we'll be able to see it um, afterwards. So please, if you think somebody might like this kind of... Um, combination collaboration please do share it with them but say for us to say we'll leave uh, you chris to the rest of your valentine's evening um and everyone else out there thank you for watching and uh, we'll leave you to the rest of yours too but um thank you very much and see you soon another lockdown book show i'm sure i'm sure we'll be here at some point but yes. take care and uh, we'll see you on the other side thanks everyone